Dear students, in the last lecture, we have studied three important digestive juices that is saliva, gastric juice, and pancreatic juice. In today's lecture, we will study first chemical composition, secretion, and regulation of bile and succus entericus. Succus entericus is also called as intestinal juice. And then we'll focus on digestion and absorption of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Bile is a yellow greenish fluid which is produced by liver and then it is stored in a gallbladder. Afterwards, it gets poured in duodenum and then it helps process of digestion. After the synthesis of bile in liver, it gets stored in the gallbladder where its composition becomes modified and it becomes concentrated eventually. For example, during its modification, there is addition of mucin and some other substances. And also there is removal of water, bicarbonate and chloride. During active digestion process, there is contraction of gallbladder that ultimately leads to supply of bile into small intestine via common duct. Secretions from pancreas and bile get mixed before these are going to be poured into the duodenum. Chemical composition of bile. Capacity of liver to produce bile per day is 500 ml, while gallbladder produces 50 ml of bile. And the bile that arises from gallbladder is 5 to 10 times concentrated than the liver bile. Bile in gallbladder, it gets acidic because if there is high pH of bile, it may result into precipitation of calcium carbonate leading to the formation of gallbladder stones. Gallbladder also adds mucin, which is a glycoprotein, as a result of which bile becomes more viscous. If there is any inflammation of gallbladder, then it may cause decrease or loss of its concentrating ability, and as a result of which digestion process would be affected in the intestine. Here is the difference between hepatic and gallbladder bile according to these constituents which are found in both of them. In case of hepatic bile, the water content is 97.3% and in gallbladder it is 89%. Total solid content in hepatic bile is around 2.7% while in gallbladder it is 11% which is clearly showing that gallbladder bile is highly concentrated and thick as compared to liver bile. pH of hepatic bile is 7 to 8.5, while the range of pH for gallbladder bile is between 5.5 to 7. Specific gravity of gallbladder bile is also high as compared to that of hepatic bile. And same is uh, for the other constituents which are found in high concentrations in gallbladder bile as compared to that of hepatic bile. There are only three constituents that are found in decreased amounts as compared to hepatic bile in gallbladder bile, and these are sodium chloride and bicarbonate. As we know that bile contains bile acids and bile salts, so all the functions of bile are due to bile acids and bile salts. So livers can synthesize 200 to 500 milligram bile acids per day. Bile acids are basically end products of cholesterol metabolism in humans. And cholic acid or cholate is considered as the most abundant bile acid which is found or present in bile. Bile acids are categorized as primary bile acids and secondary bile acids. Primary bile acids are synthesized in liver, while secondary bile acids are synthesized in small intestine by action of bacteria. Examples of primary bile acids are cholate and chenodeoxycholate, which are synthesized from cholesterol. These are conjugated with glycine and taurine and converted into glycocholate, glycochenodeoxycholate, taurocholate, and taurochenodeoxycholate. In intestine, primary bile acids are converted into secondary bile acids. For example, cholate is converted to deoxycholate, and chenodeoxycholate is converted into lithocholate. Bile acids that are secreted in the form of potassium and sodium salts are also called as bile salts. Uh, 
Conjugated bile acids are often referred as bile salts. Functions of bile, bile acids or bile salts. Bile helps neutralize acidic chyme that comes from stomach and this is due to presence of bicarbonate ions. Bile salts lower surface tension in order to emulsify dietary fats and fats are transformed into micelles and this process is necessary for digestive action of lipase enzyme. Excretory function. Cholesterol is catabolized to bile acids and this is the form it gets excreted from the body. It helps remove toxins, drugs, bile pigments, metal ions, and similar related compounds. Bile acids can also stimulate production of bile from liver and this is called cholagog effect. Bile acids can also stimulate intestinal peristalsis. Activation of pancreatic lipase. It has been observed that bile salts or in the presence of bile salts, there is effective binding of co-lipase with pancreatic lipase. So as a result of which pancreatic lipase gets activated. Intestinal juice or succus entericus. This is basically mixture of secretions which are produced by glands that are found in intestinal mucosa of duodenum, jejunum and ileum. pH of intestinal juice ranges from 7 to 8 and its volume capacity is 2 to 3 liters per 24 hours. Chemical composition. Water content of intestinal juice is 98% while the solids range from 1 to 1.5 or 2%. Solids are further distributed as inorganic and organic. Organic is mainly composed of enzymes, while the inorganic content is having bicarbonate, sodium, potassium, chloride, and some other electrolytes. Enzymes of succus entericus or intestinal juice. There are two types of enzymes. The very first type is secreted enzymes which are secreted by intestinal glands into lumen of the intestine and then brush water enzymes which are found on the apical membranes of epithelial cells. Notable examples of secreted enzymes are enteropeptidase and intestinal alpha-amidase. While the enzymes that constitute brush water enzymes are peptidases, for example aminopeptidase, dipeptidase or tripeptidase. Then in oligosaccharidases and disaccharidases, we have maltase, isomaltase, and sucrase. Phospholipases, DNases, RNases, nucleosidases, nucleotidases, these are all the examples of brush border enzymes. Stimulation and secretion of intestinal juice take place with the help of a very special and specific hormone which is released by duodenum and jejunum and this is called enterocrinin. Now what are the functions of intestinal juice? It helps neutralize acidic chyme that arises from stomach. It is responsible for causing lubrication and this is done by secretion of mucus by walls of intestine. It is also having buffer action against HCL and this is also done with the help of mucus present in it. And the same process is also aided by bicarbonate ions that come from pancreas. It also desolates food and make it isotonic with the blood plasma. IgA present in it, it helps to protect or shield against bacterial infections. Intestinal juice also contains minimal amounts of intrinsic factor and this intrinsic factor helps absorb vitamin B12. Then hydrolysis or digestion and absorption of important Biomolecules like carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids also take place with the help of enzymes found in intestinal juice. This slide is showing digestion of carbohydrates in GIT. We have one special enzyme in oral cavity and that is called salivary alpha amylase or tylin. This enzyme can act on dietary starch and converts it into starch dextrins and also into isomaltose, maltose and maltotriose. While disaccharides like lactose, sucrose and cellulose remain as such in oral cavity. Now this picture is poured into the stomach where there is low pH which can result into inactivation of salivary amylase and there is no digestion of carbohydrates in stomach. Now this mixture from stomach is poured finally into small intestine. Now in small intestine first arises secretion from pancreas that contains pancreatic alpha amylase. 
This pancreatic alpha myelase can work on these starched extracts and convert them into isomaltose, maltose, and maltotriose. While again, there is no effect on lactose and sucrose. And cellulose, this is simply excreted as such because there is no cellulase enzyme in small intestine. Now, the next turn is of mucosal cell membrane bound enzymes that are, for example, isomaltase, maltase, lactase, sucrase, trihalase. Now, these enzymes can work on these carbohydrates and eventually we can get glucose, fructose and galactose. So, all dietary carbohydrates are finally converted into glucose, fructose and galactose and these carbohydrates or monosaccharides are absorbed into portal circulation and then these are sent to liver so that these can be further uh, sent to target organs. This figure is showing absorption of monosaccharides that we have produced with the help of carbohydrate digestion in intestinal lumen. So here we have fructose, glucose and galactose in the intestinal lumen and these are now going to cross intestinal mucosal cells. There are two types of transporters. One is called GLUT5 and another one is SGLT1. GLUT is for glucose transporter 5. And SGLT1 is for sodium dependent glucose transporter 1. These transporters are present on the brush border on the luminal surface of intestinal mucosal cells. Now, this sodium glucose transporter 1 can transport glucose and galactose into the mucosal cells, while GLUT5 transporter is responsible for the transportation of fructose from intestinal lumen to the mucosal cells inside. Now, these three <clears throat> uh, monosaccharides now are present inside the mucosal cell. Now there is a single transporter which is called GLUT2 that is glucose transporter 2 that can transport these three monosaccharides into the circulation and this sodium it can further exit mucosal cell with the help of sodium potassium ATPase. This figure is representing digestion of dietary lipids. Dietary lipids constitute cholesterol esters, phospholipids, triacylglycerol, and these dietary lipids remain unchanged in oral cavity since there are no specific enzymes to act on them. There is only lingual lipase that can work on short and medium chain fats. So this mixture is poured into the stomach. In stomach as such, there is no digestion of fats but there is gastric lipase which it can again work on short and medium chain fats. So the mixture that we get after digestion of dietary lipids in stomach is composed of cholesterol esters, phospholipids, triacylglycerols and some short and medium chain fatty acids. So this mixture is now sent into the duodenum or in the small intestine where there are bile salts and pancreatic secretions. Bile salts help emulsify fats, while uh, from pancreas there is release of some enzymes that can degrade dietary lipids. So here we are going to see the enzymes which can degrade dietary lipids. For example, there is cholesterol esterase that can convert cholesterol esters into free cholesterol and fatty acids. Then we have lipase enzyme that can act on phosphatidylcholine, which is a type of phospholipid and convert it into fatty acids and glyceryl phosphorylcholine. Then we have pancreatic lipase, which is acted upon by colipase and this enzyme can convert triacylglycerol into monoacylglycerol and free fatty acids. So the primary products that we get after lipid digestion in small intestine is composed of free fatty acids to monoacylglycerol and cholesterol. So these primary products can be further taken into the form of chylomicrons and from chylomicrons these are sent to blood and from blood these are transported to target tissues. While some remaining fragments or pieces of phospholipids may be excreted, further degraded or absorbed. So this figure is showing absorption of lipids which are contained in a mixed micelle 
uh, by an intestinal mucosal cell. So this is the intestinal mucosal cell and this is the mixed micelle which is formed in the lumen of intestine. So this mixed micelle basically contains um, uh, free fatty acids, monoacyl glycerols or cholesterol and also it contains bile salts and fat soluble vitamins. So these emulsified lipids in the form of mixed micelle have two domains. One is hydrophilic domain and other is hydrophobic domain. So the hydrophilic part of mixed micelle can bind uh, with the intestinal mucosal cell and it can help absorb uh, dietary fats into the mucosal cell. And remember that short and medium chain fatty acids cannot uh, take the help of micelle to be absorbed in the intestinal mucosa. So this figure is explaining the assemblage and secretion of chylomicrons by intestinal mucosal cells. Uh, chylomicrons are formed in the intestinal uh, mucosal cells and these contain re-esterified triacylglycerol, cholesterol esters, phospholipids, and also fat soluble vitamins and the apolipoprotein which is found on the surface of chylomicron is apolipoprotein B48. Uh, so chylomicrons receive triacylglycerol and cholesterol esters after their re-esterification in the inside of intestinal mucosal cells. So long chain fatty acids can be con first converted into fatty acyl CoA with the help of synthetase enzyme. This fatty acyl CoA is incorporated into cholesterol with the help of acyl CoA, cholesterol acyl transferase, and cholesterol esters are formed. And triacylglycerol can also be formed by the condensation of one fatty acyl CoA with two monoacyl glycerol and diacyl glycerol is obtained with the help of acyl CoA monoacyl glycerol acyl transferase. Then there is second incorporation of fatty acyl CoA and diacyl glycerol is converted into triacyl glycerol. And here the enzyme used is acyl CoA diacyl glycerol acyl transferase. So this chylomicron when packed up with all these re-esterified uh, triacylglycerol, cholesterol esters, phospholipids, fat soluble vitamins, then this chylomicron is all ready uh, to be sent into circulation and then it can reach to target tissues for the delivery of these uh, dietary lipids over there. This diagram is explaining that how lipid digestion in the small intestine can be affected by hormones. So when dietary lipids arrive in the small intestine, they can stimulate the release of two important hormones in blood. One is cholecystokinin and another is secretin. This cholecystokinin hormone can inhibit gastric motility while it can increase the secretion of pancreatic enzymes from pancreas and also the secretion of bile from gallbladder. While the secretin hormone can stimulate the release or secretion of bicarbonate from the pancreas in order to neutralize the acidic kind. If there is lipid malabsorption, so it can result into increased lipid availability in the feces and that may result into statoria. And this can be caused by many disturbances in lipid digestion and absorption. For example, you see here that bile uh, cannot flow properly from liver and gallbladder into the intestine that may result into malabsorption of dietary lipids. Similarly, pancreatic juice cannot be effectively poured into it. Uh, even there is a shortened bubble, for example, that can cause decreed absorption. There may be defective cells of intestine and as a result of which there may be statoria, which is the excess lipid availability in feces. Uh, also, cystic fibrosis can also cause poor digestion. So all of these are possible causes uh, of the pathology of statoria and all of them can all result into uh, malabsorption of dietary lipids. So this is explaining digestion of dietary proteins in GIT. In oral cavity, there is no digestive action on dietary proteins since there is no hydrolytic enzyme to work on them. So dietary proteins as such pass from oral cavity into stomach. In stomach, there is well digestion of dietary proteins. And this is because of the pepsin enzyme available in the stomach. This pepsin is released from chief cells in the form of pepsinogen and it is 
converted into its pepsin that is the active form and this has proteolytic action on proteins so pepsin can convert dietary proteins into polypeptides and also a few amino acids can also be released from the digestion of dietary proteins by the action of pepsin so this mixture is now poured into small intestine where there are pancreatic secretions and also there is release of intestinal juice so pancreatic juice contains trypsin chymotrypsin elastase and carboxypeptidase these enzymes can convert polypeptides into oligopeptides and these amino acids remain as such then in the intestinal juice two important enzymes for example amino peptidases or di or tri peptidases are present which can finally convert oligopeptides into free amino acids which are then uptaken by blood circulation and these are sent to target tissues for example liver now we are going to see that how amino acids and small peptides get absorbed so free amino acids are uptaken into the enterocytes with the help of a transporter system called as sodium linked secondary transport system which is found on the apical membrane then di and tri peptides can be uptaken with the help of proton linked transport system these peptides then get hydrolyzed into the cytosolic compartment and finally these are converted into amino acids which are then released into the portal system or circulation with the help of facilitated diffusion so it means that after absorption in the portal vein after a meal containing protein there are only free amino acids available or present so these amino acids can further be metabolized by hepatocytes or they may be released into the general circulation one important note for you that branch chain amino acids are important examples of those amino acids that cannot be metabolized by the liver but they are sent from the liver to the muscle through blood circulation for their further utility so this figure is explaining cleavage or hydrolysis of dietary proteins with the help of proteolytic enzymes or proteases that are found in the pancreatic juice Uh, so the first three enzymes are endopeptidases like trypsin chymotrypsin and elastase because these cut the proteins from within and carboxypeptidase a and b are exopeptidases because these cut proteins from the terminus or the ends of protein uh, so trypsin can hydrolyze the peptide bond in which the carboxylic acid group of amino acid is contributed by arginine and lysine and so these amino acids are specific for chymotrypsin like tryptophan tyrosine phenylalanine methionine and leucine elastase can um, recognize the carboxylic end of the amino acids like alanine glycine and serine carboxypeptidase a can um, act on the amino acid sequences in which amino group is contributed by alanine isoleucine leucine and valine while carboxypeptidase b is specific of for specific for arginine and lysine these are zymogens of uh, these uh, enzymes for example zymogen or inactive form of trypsin is trypsinogen for chymotrypsin it is chymotrypsinogen for elastase this is proelastase and carboxypeptidase a and b have their zymogen forms as procarboxypeptidase a and b now degradation or breakdown or catabolism of purines so this protocol is for digestion of dietary nucleic acids so rna or dna in the mouth remain unaffected but when they arrive in the stomach there is low ph which can denature nucleic acids and you can get denatured nucleic acids in the stomach then these are poured into duodenum in the duodenum there are pancreatic secretions for example nucleases and phosphodiesterases nucleases first convert denatured nucleic acids into oligonucleotides and then by the action of phosphodiesterase we get mononucleotides then the enzymes from the small intestine for example nucleotidases convert mononucleotides into nucleosides by eliminating phosphate group from them and then again another set of enzymes called nucleosidases from small intestine convert nucleosides into pyrimidines and purines and their sugars are also released from them sugars whether deoxyribose or simply ribose are well absorbed by this circulatory system while pyrimidine and purines are not well used up uh, 
and these are converted into uric acid and then get eliminated from the body via urine. Okay students, activity for you. You are supposed to recall today's lecture and give the answers of these two queries. I'm going to reveal the answers. 